I think we have to start. We want to really stick to time. So we believe that uh, others will keep joining us. And uh, already we have 24 participants on stage. Uh, and please, I want everyone to, everyone to mute their speaker and also the camera. Yeah, please, the speaker and the camera, please kindly, kindly uh, keep them on mute. We want our, but our panelists alone to be on camera so that uh, people will be able to see them and be able to distinguish, uh, you know, between those that will be speaking. So uh, to the program proper, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, we sincerely believe that it's going to be a wonderful uh, moment, a wonderful interaction, a, uh, an issue-based uh, discussion, and it's going to be uh, full of uh, knowledge. It's going to be knowledge-driven. So I am uh, Matt Yubane, and of course I'll be the moderator for today's section, webinar section. And uh, you know, before we go into details of what we have to do, it's very important. We let you know what uh, iNuclear stands for. iNuclear is an organization with a vital aim of making nuclear knowledge accessible to all by the way uh, of constant engagement in nuclear education for public acceptance. Of, of course, iNuclear uh, also aimed at attracting and encouraging more talents to join to the careers in nuclear engineering, nuclear medicine, or any other choice in nuclear science and technology to develop their skills and creativity at every stage of their education. So in support of this effort, iNuclear promotes balance of gender, you know, both female and male, and invites young professionals to have curiosity and interest in nuclear industry. You will agree with me that today in the world of uh, you know in the world of science, in the world of tech, we 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 we, we tend to have a sort of imbalance in some fields and the nuclear field is, is, is inclusive. You see you know uh, little or very insignificant numbers of female participation and uh, there's no doubt about the fact that this as its effects. So we've been having, we, we have, uh, you know, few existing nuclear body with the same uh, organizational vision. We have, uh, you know, sometimes ago I read about women in nuclear, WNU. And uh, so iNuclear is to partner, you know, in this same vision so that all those uh, small, small stigmatization, all those uh, disorientation could be, could be, could be, you know, could be raised from the, myself for people. So that is the vision and the, the purpose of, uh, of nuclear, I mean of iNuclear as, as, as a body. So you can see on the screen, this is, uh, you know, the, the templates, women in nuclear science and increment section for attracting more talents to nuclear feed. We we'll have to, let's run through the slide. Now, the topic of this call today will be premised on these five basic, uh, you know, five uh, basic aspects: experience in your career, balanced gender in nuclear organization, impact of COVID-19 situation in nuclear area, post-COVID-19 challenges, recommendation to the younger professionals, and all of this, you know, will actually be done by our three panelists. You've seen them on the posters. So, but you are seeing them live. These are people who had gone wide and far. If I say they have gone wide and far, it means they've had a lot of exposures in the nuclear field, started, uh, you know, understanding the base of nuclear from secondary school, maybe high school, you know, uh, undergraduate, masters, and right now in PhD. So you must really be expecting, uh, you know, knowledge, deep knowledge from them. Why we engage them today? So these are just the narration of the outline for today's event. Opening remark, that's just uh, the little preamble that I gave about, uh, you know, 
what I nuclear stands for and the vision, and of course, which is attached to the essence for which we are organizing a program like this. So, but as I, I, I try to, you know, point out, you know, something driven, I mean, uh, you know, it's going to motivate everyone here today, and uh, which is going to part, uh, form part of my opening remark, okay? I want to point our attention to uh, certain historical references. I mean, historical reference of some iconic and novel women nuclear scientists. Right from, uh, I think, XS1, when I was in high school, that was when I heard about Mercury. She's a legend, she's a hero in the nuclear field. And today, and even uh, the generation to come, her name will always be on the, on the marble. So Marie Curie was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize in physics. And with a later win in chemistry, she became the first person to claim Nobel honor twice. She won Nobel Prize twice. In 1898, Marie Curie discovers something surprising. After removing uranium from the hull, that's the raw form, that contained it, she found that the residues were a lot more radioactive than the uranium itself. She reasoned that there must have been something in the rock beside uranium, some substance that is far more radioactive than uranium. After months of hard work, she found two new substances in the residues, previously unknown, that she named polonium and radium. Today, these are part of the heavy elements uh, on the on the list on the table of elements that is being still used today. This was the discovery of this woman. Uh, and she championed the development of history. This is another woman. She's heroic, but I think history, uh, you know, penned down little about this woman. Her name is Liz Mitner, the forgotten woman of nuclear physics who deserve a Nobel Prize. Nuclear physicist Liz Mitner, you know, uh, between the age of 18, I mean, existed between 1878 to 1968. A nuclear fission, the physical process by which very large atoms like uranium split into pairs of small atoms, is what makes nuclear bomb and nuclear, reaction, nuclear reactor plants possible as a process. But for many years, as the Delma now, physicists believed is it is energetically impossible for atoms as large as uranium, you know, with atom 235 or 236, atomic mass, to be split into two. There's a controversy, even though many years of uh, works from people like Kuri, Bekure, and all of that, okay, there was still, uh, 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 just like we still have in some aspects of, uh, you know, science today, where some, some, uh, some, some mathematical, some, uh, you know, some things are here to be, uh, well proven. So this was the same case until this woman attended to it. So it said on February 11, 1939, with a letter from Liz Mina to the editor of Nature, a premier international scientific journal that described exactly how such a thing could occur and even named it fission. In that letter, physicist, physicist Liz Mina, with the assistance of her younger nephew, Otto Fritsch, provided a physical explanation of how nuclear fission could occur. It's Mena and Otto Robert Fritsch discovered nuclear fission of uranium when it absorbed an extra neutron. That is one of the greatest you know, uh, work in physics. And today it stands. There is no, no way you, you find yourself in the nuclear field today without you know, talking of these uh, people with their indelible records. So all of this is to you know, you know, band together uh, with a motion to drive us into the fact that you know women they are doing great they've, they've, they did great in the past they are still doing great things in the nuclear field so uh, if you are the type that you know has been has been deterred with the idea of uh, women in nuclear that's a very bad field you know they produce bombs they kill people they, that is fallacy I want to assure you that that is fallacy You've been in this field is, is one of the very most special, uh, exceptional field where you find uh, you know, uh, you, know uh, you being fulfilled.
Our discovery was a massive leap forward in the nuclear physics, but today Lysnamina remains obscure and largely forgotten. So, uh, we, like we said, we wouldn't want to waste time. It's 11 minutes gone uh, by the side of two. We'll, once again, these are, these are our panelists. We have three of them, uh, Florencia, Celestine, and Priestler. So but we're going to listen to them as they introduce themselves in a very detailed uh, desired means. So I would like uh, Florencia, let's hear from you. Tell us more about yourself. Good evening, everyone. Florencia, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to be here with all of you this evening, uh, night or morning, depending where you are located. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, talking a little bit about me, I finished my bachelor's uh, degree in Mexico. I'm chemical engineer. I have a bachelor's with a specialty in extract extractive methodology. Um, later on, I continue my master's degree in nuclear power plant engineering at uh, Capco International Nuclear Graduate School in South Korea. There, I specialize more in the area of uh, nuclear physics or nuclear reactor design, where I work more in the fuel assembly design if on a new reactor in, in uh, South Korea that we're designing at that time from 2017 to 2019. Um, last year, I joined to the PhD program at Harbin Engineering University. I keep working here in the advanced reactor physics area and in the nuclear power plant uh, in China related more to the nuclear energy systems in China, like HPR-1000 nuclear reactor. Um, currently, I'm working in the artificial neural uh, network application in the loading pattern determination. Uh, loading pattern determination means how you are loading the fuel into the nuclear reactor for proper operation uh, in the nuclear fuel management strategy. Um, I will say also, I have participated in several technical cooperation programs at uh, IEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, for supporting nuclear power infrastructure capacity, building in member states, and introducing and ex expanding nuclear power. Um, the program in South Korea was related to a technical cooperation program from IEA. That's why I had the opportunity to go and study there. And the also PhD program at Harbin Engineering University continues in the same line. Um, talking about other experience in other areas of the nuclear industry, I attended the Summer Institute program 2019 from World Nuclear University. Um, that program was held in two countries, in Romania and Switzerland. There we have the opportunity to travel um, around the country to see the nuclear facilities, uh, research labs. Um, we also had the opportunity to visit the nuclear power plants in, in Romania. One of them was Chernagoda. The second one in Switzerland was uh, Gosgen. We, can perform, we, we were able to perform some uh, experiments as well. Um, after I also finished my, my master's degree in Korea, I had an opportunity to attend to one month of uh, internship at Kepco Nuclear Fuel. Kepco Nuclear Fuel is a company in Korea who manufactures the nuclear fuel uh, internally in the country and now they are exporting the technology to UAE, United uh, Arab Emirates. Um, they are uh, building and constructing part of the power plants in UAE from the Korean side. Now they are starting to develop a smart, small modular reactor project with uh, Saudi Arabia to continue with the nuclear power uh, expansion program. Um, I will say that um, my career started in nuclear industry from 2017. Um, it has been a great opportunity uh, to be in this field. It has a lot of things to, to give to us. Um, it, it, it provides a great opportunity to women to, to develop their career as well. Also to the female and male, they try to balance the gender. And I'll say that um, if everyone is very willing to join to the industry, you are always welcome. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah, thank you, Florencia. That's a very nice, uh, you know, detailed narration of who you are. So we'll go to the second person, and that's uh, Priscilla. Priscilla, let's know, let's know about you. 
Let's meet you. Hey everyone. I my name is Priscilla and it's an honor to be part of this program. So I would like to be a little bit brief about my experience. So I am from Ghana and I had my undergraduate education in Ghana in the field of renewable energy engineering. And after that, I was fortunate enough to work with the Ministry of Energy in policies regarding energy, including nuclear power, because uh, the country plans to go into that field. And then later on, I had the opportunity to pursue my master's in nuclear engineering uh, with Tsinghua University, where my focus was actually in radiation protection and waste management. And after my um, master's, I uh, continued with uh, my PhD, which is right now focusing on the emergency response and uh, nuclear safety aspect of nuclear energy. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah, thanks, Florencia. That's great. The last person, uh, Celestine. Celestine from the uh, US. That's Hello, it from you. Matthew. Hello, Matthew. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, it's such an honor to be part of such a meeting. Yes, uh, I'm Celestine. And I'm also from Ghana. I had uh, my bachelor and uh, master's degree in the physics department at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Um, during my bachelor's degree, I majored in biomedical physics and, uh, and I researched on measurement of radio concentration in water. And then after, I continued with my master's in nuclear physics. And then my research focused on uh, uh, biophysics lacquer compartments with bagwind deformity in elderly women. I um, also had the opportunity to participate in some conferences in Rwanda called African School of Physics, where I had the opportunity to uh, share ideas and establish network with um, scientists in the field. And then last year, um, I joined the physics and astronomy department at the Mississippi State University for a nuclear, to pursue my PhD in nuclear physics uh, with a research focus in low energy physics. Thank you. That's Good evening, everyone. I think for the ones who cannot have sound in the presentation, uh, please uh, check the options in the microphone. Maybe you, you have to join by the audio in the chat. Maybe that's why you are not able to hear anything. Check, please, the settings configuration. Thank you. Thank you. 
Send a message right now. Any message. Hello everyone, we are just experiencing small uh, technical problems with the network. We will appreciate your, your patience and cooperation. Uh, the moderator will join us into the meeting. Uh, he's just having some network problems. Thank you. Hello. Matthew, are you here with us? Yeah, I'm very sorry. Yeah, please, can you, you see my can you still see my slide? No, please, can you put the slides, please? Uh, there was just some mm -hmm. uh, network problem. Okay. Yeah, hello. 
Can you all hear me? Yes, we yeah. can hear you. Please. Yeah, we uh, can hear you. Yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. Sincere apologies to everybody. I, it's, you know, these are one of some of those uh, worrying issues. So, issues that, uh, that are beyond our power. So, it's, it's network. So, I'm very sorry for that. Yes, yeah, so we, we are moving straight to the real issue. We want to engage our panelists. And so, uh, the meeting is going to be issue based. So, we are going to ask them, you know, specific uh, questions as related to the, to the core drive. For today's meeting, and so, and that's why we said, if there, if anybody have questions, please kindly, you know, type them at the typing charts, the chat, the chat page of uh, of this platform, so that after this round of uh, engagements, we are going to throw those questions to any of them. So the first thing, the first one is going to is this is going to be the rule, please. Each panelist has two two minutes to respond to the question we'll be throwing. And so please, nevertheless, make it detailed, make it, make it, uh, make it explanatory, you know, because uh, of, the, of the diverse people who are on this platform, these are people, many people are not in nuclear. The first question I will ask Florencia, what challenges is your career, what, challenging, what challenges in your career did you experience because of your, your gender as a female? What's what's uh, what are the challenges you've experienced either previously or in the I mean either now or in the past? Thank you very much for the question, Matthew. Um, I think for us, like especially at the beginning when we are females in this in this industry, sometimes we we have to to prove more that we are capable and that we have knowledge. Um, unfortunately, still we have to face troubles between the gender balance because maybe cultural problems, maybe lack of exposure to the, to the women to the, in the industry. But we don't have to see this thing as a negative point. I will say this is a way to, to show people uh, how we should respect each other, how is the way that we are addressing the situation. And the most important thing is um, as a ladies and uh, everyone who, who, who is in this field, we have to be very humble. We have to be responsible with our answers and words to the people. And we have to deliver our message uh, correctly and with uh, good communication skills. Um, I will say that um, in my experience, I, I have some uh, discussions and debates with uh, female and male colleagues. And it's hard to, to prove every time that you are very capable to do the work. Um, still, there are some gaps, as I said. But we are trying to work towards that. We have to, to keep the value of our knowledge and be more prepared every day. Uh, show to the people also a way to, to find their answers to some of the questions and challenges that we face every day. And uh, this is a work that has to continue for a long time. Thank you. All right, thanks so much. Uh, to the second panelist, let me, let me exhaust the woman from the US. Celestine, what has been your challenge as a female so far in the, I mean, in this, in this career? Yeah, thank you very much, Matthew, for the question. For me, uh, one of the challenges that I've faced is uh, discouragement from friends and colleagues, yes. Um, oh. <laughs> you know, um, physics is, uh, they see physics as a male do dominant field, so most time, uh, this, people see it as a no-go area for women. So most time, when people approach me and then they ask me the question that, okay, so um, which program are you studying or what career are you pursuing? And then I mention that, okay, I'm a physics student. Then they get surprised and uh, and they, they see that, you know, it's like you've chosen a difficult career path for yourself. So uh, you wouldn't be able to have a social life or wouldn't be able to combine it with uh, family uh, life. So these are some of the negative comments. And uh, I quite remember, you know, uh, in class, um, some of my colleagues come to me and uh, they, they ask that. And so I have a strong personality. So they, they see that, you know, um, me pursuing such a field will be very difficult for me uh, to find a husband in the future. 
<laughs> you know, so they pass this kind of negative comment that is so discouraging at times. And but you know, so one thing I would say is that um, once you are determined and you are focused, so you shouldn't allow this negative comment to sit in. If you know, it will deter you from pursuing your career track. That's great. Determination and focus. I, I I'm going to pocket that from that. Priscilla, let's hear from you. I think uh, what um, Laurentia and Celestine both said, actually, it's one of the main problems uh, if you're a female and you are in this field, you um, encounter. I'm not trying to be a bit gender biased here, but one thing that I think it's uh, so dominating as a problem is the stereotypes that uh, females in this uh, industry, mostly not only in the nuclear field, but those that find themselves in the male dominated field face, like uh, stereotyping and uh, people actually um, taking your confidence and boldness as being proud and arrogance and actually one thing I've also noticed is that uh, we lack mentorship, mentorship from females like uh, you know it's a difficult field like you trying to do your thing and always having to prove that you are the best and the only thing you can actually bridge this uh, gender bias thing in this field is just to be very hardworking, you know, and if you try to exercise a little bit confidence, you are seen as an arrogant and stuff like that. But I think uh, there is more that we can do, like uh, as women in the field, if we can't actually find mentors, there are a lot of mentors that we can actually approach. And in our difficulty, let's say in your research or uh, in your academics, you can just uh, uh, talk to them. One thing I've also realized is that most females in this uh, industry lack uh, the, 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 I don't know, the confidence to actually ask for help from their colleagues if they are going through something. So I think we can just learn from that and uh, be confident, even though you, you would be misjudged but that shouldn't actually uh, tame your focus. So that is all that I, I would have to say for this. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much. <clears throat> yeah, to the second question, we are going to follow the same order. Uh, Priscilla, I mean, uh, Florencia, Celestine, then Priscilla. What was one of the most difficult challenges in your career until now? The most specific now, the most. Okay. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Thank you for your question. I would say it was uh, when I traveled to South Korea in 2019 because my knowledge in the nuclear area, it was not too technical as the other people when we were joining to the masters. Most of the people that were my classmates and colleagues and friends, they were already working in the nuclear energy agencies around the, around the world in their countries. They were coming from the regulatory bodies, operator companies, because all of us, we were going uh, through the mission to learn together um, the knowledge of uh, nuclear industry. But from the scratch, I had to start every single topic uh, to know things about the nuclear power plant, thermal hydraulics, uh, core design. And it was a challenge because my degree was in chemical uh, engineering. So um, this was a good time to prove myself and challenge myself to know how capable I'm, I, uh, I will be to learn those things. Uh, I remember when I had one of my uh, interactions with one of my, of my teachers in Korea, I asked him, which are the most difficult areas in the nuclear power plant? And then he told me it's uh, thermal hydraulics, reactor core design, and uh, radio waste management. But radio waste management is another area that it is very apart from uh, thermal hydraulics and core design. Then I told him, I will try to study more uh, thermal hydraulics and reactor core design because it's like the heart of the nuclear power plant. 
then I had to study every single day, every weekend. I was not going out. And it's, it's, uh, we stress again to the point that we have to prove that we know and that we had the knowledge. So having that part of the um, gap of the knowledge, I had to keep uh, time learning myself. Um, I will say uh, back in the 2017, that was one of the hardest time for me because I have to be more uh, knowledgeable in this area. Thank you. Okay, well, that's great. Yeah, Celeste. Yeah, so for me personally, one of the more challenges that I had is uh, uh, inadequate in, um, uh, inadequate of um, programming skills. Yes, my field is said that uh, we do um, a lot of uh, simulation and modeling, and the, most of these goals that uh, we run are very difficult to modify. So uh, I can't remember one time uh, I was assigned a task by my supervisor. So I was having challenges with my code. So I, I went back to her and then showed my problem to her and I asked her to help me uh, debug my code. And what she told me was, in code, I'm not a computer person, so I should try and, and fix the error myself. <laughs> So it was so difficult for me because uh, some of these code, we spent hours, we spent weeks just to debug the error and up to now, it's still a challenging thing for me. So for me, that is one of the things that I'm having problem with currently. Okay. Yeah, Priscilla. Hello, Matthew. So uh, one of the challenging thing to that I'm actually facing or faced is uh, still, you know, getting the work done in everything. You know, the whole thing is challenging, so I don't really know who, where to point. But one thing I've realized is that uh, if we go into it with the mentality that it is challenging, it will continue to, to, to be challenging. And then uh, one thing is that we shouldn't actually shy away from asking help. Although sometimes, you know, like as Celestine said, your supervisors might leave you to actually do the work on your own. But uh, I think we have, if you are just the only person, you have maybe colleagues or something, I don't know, but never try to shy away from asking for help. People are more willing to help if you just ask, although uh, it's everything about this is so challenging from starting to prove and do extra work and work late, everything is just challenging, but you should always be in the right mind, you know, the positive mindset that, although it is challenging, I'm just going to pull through. So. Even if you encounter the problem, just seek for help. And then who knows, someone might just help you to make it all easy, you know. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Okay. Now the third question. Which strategies do you know that nuclear organizations are doing around the world to balance gender in the program? You know, we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, you know, like a partner vision of bodies like a, you know, women in nuclear, which I, I, I believe it exists in Switzerland. I've read about it. And uh, maybe something like, I mean, a, an organization like iNuclear. So which, what's, what are the, what are the, if we are trying to encourage people who oh, come, there are you know, greater opportunities for women in nuclear. So what, what are those strategies as an expert? You know that these nuclear organizations are doing around the world to balance genders in the program. Right, yeah, thank you very much, Matthew, for that question. Um, I think a lot of organizations around the world are, are trying to support uh, ladies uh, in this field because they also want to give the opportunity to all of, all of the capable people that they can do the job. It doesn't mean if you're female or male, but they are just trying to, to, to match the numbers between uh, female and male. Um, in my experience, I know uh, IEA is uh, creating new technical cooperation programs that they are encouraging uh, women 
to join to the, to the field as I had the opportunity to go for the training in South Korea. Now here I'm in, I'm in China. I also went through uh, other conferences like IYNC 2018 in Bariloche. I went also to the um, Summer Institute program from Warren O'Carey University. I will say that um, they are really doing a great job. I'm not the only lady in the field that uh, joins through the IEA programs. Like we know around uh, around this this industry, more colleagues that they are uh, doing in the same track, and it's very uh, it's very um, how can I say it? It's very good to see more female in the in the in the industry because whatever we go, we will see maybe there are half of the audience or maybe a quarter of the of the of the audience are female, and it means uh, the time is changing. Uh, this is a great opportunity for the young uh, females to encourage them to join to the industry. Um, also, the university, the other institutions where I join, um, they are always encouraging ladies to participate in technical uh, presentations, be more um, expert in the field. They are trying to, to connect with uh, experts and mentors around the world. So I'll say um, this is some of the strategies that the, that the industry is doing. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Celestine, are you there? Celestine. I, I guess Celestine is having a network challenge. Priscilla, please, let's have you. Can you, can you suggest to us those strategies being put in place currently? Uh, I, I, thank you for the question. So as uh, Florentia said, the IAEA just rolled out a new fellowship, you know, Marie Curie Fellowship to include more females in uh, undergraduate graduate studies in the nuclear field. It, it's just one avenue to attract uh, females in that. And part of this, I know that the the Chinese society also have this agreed to, you know, sponsor like females from other parts to have this study in here. And then they would also um, engage in some, you know, technical skills training in their companies, in their industries. And one thing that I also know that outside China, uh, other places are also doing, for instance, is my country, that uh, they, in Ghana, like for, in a way to, you know, uh, increase like workload and increase the women in this field, they give, you know, uh, opportunity for women to also take part in education from graduates to the PAD with, you know, flexible terms. And that is one thing that they are doing. And other areas like the women in nuclear also have this uh, programs that they host like conferences in a way to empower women in the field and also make it more attractive for, for young females to develop interest in this field. So I believe that most organizations are doing their best to um, entice women, um, entice women activity in the nuclear field. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think this very question we just asked is very important because it forms uh, the bedrock for the, the real encouragement we are talking about. And uh, I think with this explanation, it, it really shows that there's a greater prospect in the field for women. And so for everyone that's listening, go and start telling if you are a male, start encouraging your younger, your younger ones that there is a great hope for female. Uh, we need more Bekure, we need, I mean, uh, Mercury, and uh, a lot more <clears throat> in this nuclear field. Now the first, the fourth question, I still guess our top panelist is still having a challenge with her, with her network. I hope she joins soon. Yeah, she's still having trouble with the network. Okay. Now, how can we encourage female participation in nuclear? I think this is very succinct. So personally, Florence, how can you, how can you, if you meet, uh, you know, a, 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 just a layman, I mean, somebody who, is, who has not, who has no 
knowledge about nuclear? How can you really put that person in? Um, person, thank you very much for that question. Um, personally, when, when I finished my master's uh, program in South Korea, I joined, I returned to Mexico. And the first thing that I did um, in the first week when I returned to Mexico is I went back to my university and uh, I asked the professors if I can just give some uh, presentation to the students who were like in the last semester of the, of the career of uh, chemist, chemical engineering, if they want to show the chance or like show them what I did before and at least they can have the same opportunity as me to connect with uh, the university in Korea as well or with other institutions because this is a work that we have to continue generation through generation. Um, I went back, I told them like what I did, like which, were, which uh, was the program that I was joining, which uh, knowledge we have to, we need to have more. I even shared some of my lecture materials that I have uh, from Korea. And then I told them like they can keep the contact with me or with uh, any other organizations that they need to connect just to show the students that uh, we are capable to do the work even though maybe we were not uh, related from the beginning with the industry, but the university gave us the abilities and the knowledge to overcome the challenges and to try to join to, to, to this part. I also tried to join to other STEAM uh, programs for um, younger uh, girls, young girls like uh, high school or middle school, that at least they can see some of the role models. Um, Sometimes when we don't have some mentor, like which type of uh, bachelors we want to, to develop ourselves, it's very difficult to take the, the decision because it's for an, our entire life. And I will say if we keep the contact and we are like uh, giving some talks or programs to the young uh, female, they will be more uh, connected with the industry. Thank you. That was very, very wonderful. Mentorship. Is very key. Priscilla, please come here from you. How do you, how, what, what's your encouragement for female uh, participation? I think, uh, thank you for the question. I think one thing we can actually do first of all is to firstly clear some misconceptions about the field. You know, we are living in a technology driven world now and where there are lots of uh, things going on in the media before someone actually gets a first-hand knowledge of what uh, nuclear technology is about. They already have a pre-assumption of how dangerous and difficult it is. So I think first of all, before we can attract uh, people to that, like females, we have to clearly tackle the misconception and then we have to have uh, most of them have no idea so we have to also impact like if not in the hardcore area like you just have to make them understand what it entails because trust me nuclear technologies is around us every day in our lives like we have the technology mostly every day we come in in contact with it every day so one thing that we can do as a lay person uh, to a lay person is just clear misconception and create the awareness awareness by uh, educating in a simple in a simpler way. So I think what we did uh, with iNuclear last year that we had this seminar where uh, in in school where we we educated people on the misconceptions we actually try to prove the misconceptions wrong, like a fallacy. And then we actually also uh, gave them a little ideas about what nuclear is. And most of them came to the awareness that actually uh, they got the whole thing wrong. And, you know, it's because of misjudgment, what they've seen. So it's like they already have something in. They need to pour it out before they can grasp it. And one thing also to attract young girls at an early stage is encouraging them to partake in, you know, STEM field and uh, giving them good mentorship, you know, 
from all that is going on. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. That's, those, those are very wonderful uh, encouragements. Please, I want to also announce to all our participants that there will be avenue for people. You know, if you have any contribution, please we'll recognize you. And also, don't forget that uh, if you have questions too, please you are free to either or mute your mic and say it, or you type it on the chat group. Please, we want contribution. So, uh, but then we have uh, just one or two questions left. Uh, Celestine, I guess you're back. Celestine? Is she back? Okay. Okay. Uh, must, uh, Mr. Abdul, Abdul, Abkari. Please, yes, we can. Let's have you. Let's have you. Let's have you. Before we yeah, answer. Thank you, Madrito. And thank you to the other panelists also. You guys have been doing a great job. Um, actually, I have a question. It's like a concern. Do you guys have any fear that in the nearest future, nuclear power as a working technology can be misused? So, uh, and, uh, ready to and, and also, sorry, so let me just put the two questions together. And also, okay. the what about the risk of uh, air pollution that comes with? This technology, you know, we all know that is more, uh, I mean, exposed to radiative uh, materials, you no? Know? And this have effects in, uh, in the greenhouse. So I don't know, what, what, uh, what do you have any fear that this can, this can get out of hand in the nearest future? Mm -hmm. I can take that question yes. if you want. You didn't get the question? I can take that question mm -hmm. if you want. Oh. Yes, let's hear you. Let's hear you. Okay. Right, sir. Uh, Mazu, um, as we know, uh, unfortunately, in the past, uh, it happens uh, several uh, accidents like Chernobyl, um, Fukushima, and TMI2 in the uh, United States. Um, Engineers in the field, um, experts, they have been working very hard to prove and to improve the technology day by day. Um, in the experience that I had when I was also studying in Korea and from other colleagues, uh, the technology is safe. Of course, we cannot uh, compromise the safety from, from, the, from the users. And there is always a risk that we will, we, even we try to measure, there will always be a risk and the impact, but engineers are trying to work very hard to operate uh, safely the reactor, the trainings, the programs that they have is very accurate, uh, the methods that they are learning. And uh, I will say day by day, uh, regulatory bodies in each country, as well as the inspectors and the organization from IEA or Nuclear Energy Agency, they're working very hard to control the use of the of the nuclear field because of course there is a high risk of the uh, terrorism attack but um, the inspectors and the safeguards they are doing a great job to monitoring 24 hours of the of the day the 36 five, uh, 365 days of the year uh, in the nuclear power plants you have cameras uh, connected through the IEA um, uh, headquarters they are monitoring every use of the nuclear fuel. And uh, personally, talking about the associated risk to the real radioactive pollutants, um, in the nuclear power plant, there are some vehicles and there is some uh, um, equipment as well, and some team that they are monitoring uh, day by day how the air is flowing into the nuclear power plant, if they are not going to have any release from fission products and the, the technology and the components are working very well. It's very safe. Every, every country, they have their own technology, but they, can, uh, they cannot approve if they don't have the permission from the regulatory body. That is the most important thing. Um, the regulatory body is the one who is in charge of uh, giving a uh, license operation to the nuclear power plants, to the other organizations who wants to do some uh, experiments in their research reactors. 
So I will say they cannot uh, do other things if the regulatory body is not allowing them. Thank you. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, I, I, I strongly believe that's a, very, that's a very good response. And also, of course, myself, I mean, I mean, I mean I, I've been in this field and of course, to an extent, I've read more and more about the, the you know, a lot of things. And so I believe that one of the most powerful uh, systems being put in place is that of IEA. IEA is just like FIFA that guides every bit of, uh, you know, steps, every country that involves in football does. So IEA, the money, nobody is, no country is 100% independent of the nuclear energy is deployed. And that is one of the reasons why, of course, many of we can, you know, browse on Google. You hardly see anywhere, any country, either, even if the country tends to be a terrorist country, not will ever be, uh, be able to use nuclear, and, uh, nuclear technology for, I mean, the, in the, I mean, from the bad side. So, uh, Mr. Ab Abdul, uh, Mr. Mas, Mr. Masood, I, I, I hope you are satisfied with that question, with that answer. But I guess you, have, you asked a second question. Can you reiterate on it again? Uh, yeah, actually, the the first question is much more of uh, it's much more philosophical. Than, okay. Uh, the one you just answered now is a, is a little bit philosophical, but the second part, which is to me more important, is the risk, the health risk that we are posing to the environment because we are working with uh, radioactive elements and we know how dangerous this can be to health. So yeah, what level, what level of this element can we actually allow in our environment and that we, we have confidence that it is safe for us? Yes, I think Priscilla is a, is a nuclear expert, I mean, uh, it's a radiation expert. So you'll be able to give a very nice response to that. Priscilla, please let's have you. Celestine, are you back? Yes, much longer. Yes. I was having connection. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. So Priscilla, we are listening. What is the level of protection being put in place? Unmute yourself. Oh, is uh, Priscilla? Okay. Is she okay, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. I'm here. Yeah. So I just want to say that one of uh. Should I say a lot of people are concerned with this radiation because uh, one of the con uh, misconceptions that people have is that they actually get uh, nuclear power plant produces a lot of radiation and you know radiation just interferes with their genetic makeups makeup and stuff like that. So uh, in in the misconception that we did, nuclear, the radiation produced from a nuclear power plant is actually less than, I, I want to get the actual percentage, it's actually less than uh, uh, considering the radiation we actually get from the sun. Okay, and, okay. And this fact is actually one of the, one of the encompassing thing that is pulling people out from you know like the public opinion and of nuclear stuff so i'm actually trying to get the exact question exact answer so that i don't mis misquote you or i don't mislead you in the answer so i will put the answer in the chat in the chat okay. of the zoom Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, because of our time, uh, we need to speed up. I think we have uh, just we're going to have uh, ten minutes more, you know, plus the conclusion from people. So I'm going to wrap up the last two questions into one, and three of you are going to provide your answers. Now, our this is COVID-19 era. We knew that this has really changed the face of the world, academic inclusive. For since January, you know, every institution, I mean, all our schools has been shut down. We've been working from our from our, from our workstation, I mean, from our rooms. And uh, I believe this has really affected. So we want to know, how has COVID-19 situation helped you to grow in your career? And what has your institution or organization been doing to prepare for 
the post-COVID-19 challenges. Please, do you grab the question or I should come, come back? Can no, I no, say no, it again? No, 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 it's okay. Okay, so, yeah, so, Francia, let's have you. Um, I will say from this experience, of course, it's very unfortunate to, to live in this experience, not just in China, it's around the world. COVID-19 is uh, it's something that uh, no one was planning, uh, I will say. Like, everyone maybe they were having like a lot of plans, but the uh, situation is different and maybe we have to move on into different ways of learning. Um, in my own experience, I will say that uh, this time I have been trying to use efficiently uh, doing my thesis project, doing my reports, uh, attending to webinars as well from the experts in the industry because uh, the nuclear industry, they have realized this is a good time that we have to, to connect each other. So many other organizations, they are doing webinars around the, the industry, trying to connect uh, leaders as well, trying to show the technology and find a way for, for the other um, staff in the, in the industry to keep doing the work. Of course, it's, it's hard to, to do it at the beginning uh, remotely, like from home, but day by day, we are trying to, to face this challenge and also overcome this situation. Um, I will say also uh, the university here with us, they are taking care of us very well. Uh, they are trying, they are really taking seriously the social distancing. Uh, in our own experience, I will say it, in, uh, here in Harvard Engineering University, we are still locked down because there is still this, this uh, this uncertainty that maybe we, we can have the possibility to get exposure to the virus. So the, the teachers and the authorities of the university, they have recommend to keep social distancing. Um, we hope that soon uh, we can return to our new reality because the things are, are not gonna be as the same as, as the way it used to be. Now some things and some methods uh, should change for our own safety. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Celestine, you're welcome back. Yeah, thank you very much, Matthew. And uh, yeah. what I would like to say is that, yes, the corona pandemic, you know, has uh, disrupted lives in so many ways, and uh, especially those of us in the academic field, you know, we are used to traditional methods of learning, and uh, all of a sudden everything just flipped upside down, and we are being introduced to new methods of learning. So me, in one area that, uh, that has helped me grow is uh, developing a um, positive mindset and uh, um, attitude towards work. Yes, so uh, what I'll be doing more is uh, uh, um, watching um, online videos uh, that will help me uh, sharpen my program skills and also uh, reading more materials on my project so that I will gain full understanding of what I am researching on. And also um, one of the organizations that is uh, uh, putting uh, more effort into um, uh, one of the organizations that I would say that is working that tirelessly to help uh, contribute to this pandemic is the OWSD, which I'm a member of the Ghana chapter. So what they are doing is the African Network is uh, uh, in partnership with the OWSD um, Network. They are um, offering funding to uh, scientists uh, who want to carry research on the COVID-19. And this fund is up to 100,000 USD and it's available for 24 months. So this grant uh, is, will be given to uh, research uh, consortia and uh, uh, organization, individual organizations. Yes, so, and the preference will be given to those in the middle and low income countries. And uh, um, I think the deadline for application for this call is uh, 28th June 2020. Yes. Wow, so that is tomorrow. Yes. I think if we have anybody interested in that, we should start piling up the the application right now. That's great. That's great. Honestly, that's great. Priscilla. Uh, yes, Matthew. So, uh, what actually what my school is actually doing in this pandemic era is that 
uh, there are lots of um, <coughs> programs that are being, you know, to take care of the mental health of the students at the same time, give them opportunity to explore and that nothing actually changes. Organizing conferences online and still broadening the horizon of students in research, in publications, and to also get mentees and mentorship session with uh, others online. So, and I think the OECD also plan on doing uh, certain strategies that has been laid down in the COVID-19 era. And during this era, I, I think iNuclear published an article that specifically talks about what some of these uh, nuclear industries that are located in China is actually using their nuclear technology to do in uh, in this field right from you know ster uh, sterilization of the equipment the ppes and uh production of face shields and other stuff and still producing radiation radiation therapy stuff for the hospitals to continue in their protection for citizens so uh the thing is uh the work in the nuclear field although the world is at a standstill right now but the work is actually ongoing. Students are actually still studying and, and researchers are also still continuing with their research. So uh, the only thing that changes is that now we just have to, you know, it's just like a virtual thing. So that is what we are adapting to right now. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I just realized that uh, the program is to span between, you know, uh, 13 o'clock, 12 o'clock to, you know, 13, I mean, uh, 15, 30. That's, that, means, that means we still have more time. I was thinking, uh, we, we are, we, I mean, we are beyond schedule. So, please, we still, like we said, we need more contribution from people. I could say, in fact, uh, a lot of uh, uh, erudite uh, nuclear scholars on the, on the chat group. No, I knew, please, well, I want to indulge you. I really want to hear from you, want to learn from you by the time we are done with this. So uh, the very last one, just in a simple statement for the three of you, what is your advice for young professionals, not female alone now, that is both male and female? You know, maybe somebody in high school, somebody in, uh, in secondary school, like uh, Florence has said, you met some, you did chemistry, and you know, by the virtue of a mentorship, you begin to find your, your, your trajectory into nuclear. So what's the same advice uh, are you willing to give to the young professionals that is coming, the coming ones? Let me start from Celestine. Celestine, what's your advice? Yeah. What advice do you Okay, thank you very much for that question, Matthew. Uh, for me, the advice I would like to give the younger generation or the professional is uh, one, what I would say is uh, they should be focused and also and enjoy their field of work. And then two, um, they should network and then um, find a role model and a mentor that will guide and nurture them. And then three, Yes, um, the shoe embrace of failure. Okay, thank you so much. That's a great advice. Ah, Florencia, mm. thank what's you, your advice? Um, I would say like um, sometimes it's hard because uh, very few people maybe in this life will really want to help us. But I will say that uh, when someone knocks your door or when, so when someone is willing to help you, take that help and never forget what they have done for you. We have to keep developing our career and knowledge. Sometimes this is hard because we need to push ourselves to, to read more, to show curiosity in certain area. And uh, it's hard, I, I would say, but we have to try. If we don't try, we will never know what we are capable for. And we also have to, we need to have some, uh, some hopes. We need to have some dreams. Because if we have some aspirations in life, we, we will know exactly 
where we are going, to, we, we, where we want to go and how, which way or which direction we should take. As uh, Celestine said, uh, when we have mentors or when we have supervisors, they play a crucial role in our careers because they are the ones that will encourage us to, to go for different ways, different projects, certain areas that maybe we are not, we, we didn't think about it to, to learn. So don't don't take it as a as a bad or as a negative point if someone um tries to, to to tell you learn something new. Don't take it as a, as an offense or as a negative comment. Try to to find a way and be creative. I will say. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Priscilla. Priscilla, uh -huh. can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I was just typing the uh, the answer to uh, the question that was asked regarding the those limits uh, in the okay. chat. So you can just find it there. So my my little advice is that um, one thing I've realized is that uh, if you are in need, just like what Celestine said, uh, just don't ask for help. People are willing to help you than you ever know. And one thing I also want to advise us all is that we shouldn't stop reading. You can't excel if you are in the research field. You can't excel if you don't like reading, you know. And one thing I also want to say is that we should have a positive focus. Uh, if you perceive it to be hard, it's going to be hard. But if you have this focus that no matter what you are just going to pull through, it's it's really much or less uh, very easy to you know to do to excel. And and one thing that we also I also want to say is to be supportive. You know, uh, we should be supportive towards one another maybe uh, someone needs help from me maybe someone needs maybe a research direction or maybe they need uh, an input in their what they are asking you know we shouldn't uh, be in our our little corner we should just uh, explore ask for help learn and then you know continue to be to work hard and i think we would be good Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so, so much. Florencia uh, from Abin and United University. Uh, Celestine from uh, Mississippi State University and uh, Priscilla from Tsinguan University. Thank you so much. You've really uh, done a great job in responding to some of these vital questions. I believe there are some questions, so we have to uh, before we begin to you know, welcome contributions and comments from our audience, let me let me touch down on some uh, comments here. Somebody said, he said, I'm sorry I've not been able to participate fully, but I thank all the participants for the great job done. The issue of gender parity is common in the industry, as I've witnessed over the six, over, in over six years. Sorry. Okay, as I've witnessed over six years of my experience, but this is our gen but this is our generation, but our generation should ensure that such doesn't happen going forward. Cheers, Valencia team. Thank you so much for that comment. Uh, I have this question and I'm going to pose it to the three of you. Or perhaps if uh, because your response will be what I'll give to the person. She's a lady, she probably, you know, she probably messaged me. So I would like to summarize the question. She said she has been passionate about nuclear since her undergraduate. She studied physics. She now said that, of course, uh, being from a developed, I mean, a, a developing country where we observe, for example, you know, we have uh, countries like, for example, uh, in Africa, we we've not really deployed in the in the maximum. We've not really. Uh, they deploy uh, nuclear technology in so many areas. So now she's saying that if ah, be, coming from such an environment, you know, and uh, <clears throat> she observed that there are opportunities in nuclear, in the nuclear field in countries 
where English are not the major language. Maybe, for example, China, Mexico, and you know, some other countries that are not uh, English speaking. He said, how is she going to be able to surmount that language barrier? Let me try to, yeah, Florissa, let's hear from you. Let's hear from you. For the language barrier. Um, yes, to study nuclear. In a, maybe, for example, in a country like China, so how could somebody not feel yeah. escape such? You know, uh, when I went to Korea, it's Asian country. It's not China, but it is Asian country. I'm not native speaker in English. My mother tongue is, uh, is Spanish. And uh, sometimes we have to face some challenges because we need to know more than two languages when we are when it is not our local language. I will say. Um, first of all, we have to learn some technical words in a new language, which in my case was English. So we need to learn and go through these concepts. Second one, we are studying in a new country with a totally different culture from our our culture. I will say and we have to try to cope. We will face a lot of challenges. We will see maybe things that we don't like, but my best advice is we have to analyze very carefully the environment. We have to try to take the, the, the positive points from the environment and try to make it as a good practice for us. Uh, in my experience, Koreans were very organized. Uh, they were also working very hard um, they just go straight to the point uh, when you have to present some ideas, you have to think very simple, you have to do it very accurate, and it helps you to, to, to um, have a better method to develop your ideas. And it's also hard sometimes because you will face a lot of uh, uh, communication language. Maybe they were also not good in English, maybe you were also not good enough, but you have to still try to communicate your idea. So my, one of my best advice is uh, have an open mind that maybe is not the environment that you were expecting in your reality, but you are it still is hard the reality. You should be willing to, to, to learn and to understand how things are working because it's, it's not just for coincidence that you had to go there. It will, it will exist a reason. Maybe not at that time, but maybe in the future, you will think about it and then you will say, that's why I had to go to a certain place, or that's why I had to learn from those people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Priscilla, what advice could you give to such person in overcoming a, in a language barrier? Uh, uh, Matthew, I think we all face uh, the challenge of a language barrier. Uh, for instance, I know that um, some people have to take their studies. Uh, I'm talking about those of us in China. Some people have to take their studies, their major courses in, in Chinese. And what they do is that they actually dedicate one year of their their studies to study the language, you get it. So I think it's just the point of determination. If you know that you are coming to a country where you don't speak the same second language, uh, like you are coming here and the main instruction is in Chinese, you just have to be dedicated and just, you know, just uh, sacrifice one year of your studies to to learn the language. Yes, yes to learn the language because I uh, I don't know. Then that means you have to choose a different location if you don't want to uh, get uh, the main the main thing in the studies. Then you can choose a different location where language wouldn't be a barrier. But if you know you are coming here and your studies is in Chinese, there is no easy way to go about it without learning Chinese. So that is my 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 contribution. So it's all about determination. And also from my uh, past observation, I observed that most countries offering nuclear related programs are almost uh, you know being offered in English. Like for example, in HCU. Our program is in English. 
So everything here is in English and in fact, the few schools that I know in China too, because of, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a collaborative uh, effort of IEA and uh, some of these. So it's, it's, I, I, don't really, I don't really think that uh, should be a big issue. And in any school where you find that, the best thing is to work is to adapt, like you've rightly said. There is nothing good that comes easy. So you learning the language is even an added advantage. Priscilla, I believe you don't have that challenge, but I know you can still see something. You know, in the US, the language is English, of course. As a matter of fact, they are part of the pioneers of, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's their language. So, but what's, what do you have to say to that? Mm. Ah, Celestine, I mean, Celestine, sorry, Celestine. Celestine, are you there? Yes, I'm here, about you. Yeah, so what, what advice do you have to give to somebody who is considering a language barrier as, as a, maybe an impediment to studying in English, I mean, uh, to study nuclear program in countries that may not be offering it in English? Well, like uh, Priscilla said, so what I would say is that uh, if the person is so determined and uh, want to pursue a career in nuclear physics, the language shouldn't be a problem at all because uh, maybe dedicating one year to learn the language and uh, shouldn't be any difficulty for that person. So yes, so the person should just be focused and be determined and he or she will be able to do it. Okay, thank you so much. Now let's go to our audience. Uh, Mr. Emmanuel, I guess you have something to say. Please unmute your mic and tell us and talk to us. Good evening, everyone. I'm Emmanuel from ATU. I have a simple question to ask. Though technology is booming and nuclear is also advancing, but there are some countries like Switzerland, Germany and others, they are running away from nuclear. I want to find out why. Hmm. Thank you. Why? Yeah, okay, Florencia. Florencia. Uh, thank you very much for the question, Emmanuel. Um, unfortunately, um, this uh, decision doesn't depend from the nuclear operator or the nuclear regulator. Uh, the last decision has the, the politics of the country and the energy metric distribution program. Um, there are other types of energies like renewable energies, solar, uh, wind, you have also hydropower, and some of these countries, they also have other type of resources. Um, it doesn't mean that the technology is not working well. The technology is working perfectly, but uh, this is about politics. Maybe some of the leaders, they are afraid that uh, something can happen. Maybe they have taken the decision to run uh, a different type of program. But uh, personally, I had the opportunity also to visit Switzerland uh, last year. They, they were working also with uh, MOX fuel, which is mixed oxide fuel, is fuel from the reprocessing uh, cycles of the nuclear power plant. And they were trying to come up with new strategies. The plants are working, the nuclear power plants are working, but even though they, they are trying to extend their license operation, um, this, this doesn't depend from the nuclear operator. It depends from the government. Um, Please, uh, I will say like from the newcomer countries that are uh, coming in to establish their nuclear programs, do not feel uh, discouraged because maybe Germany or other top countries are trying to, to phase out nuclear. It's more for the politics problem. It's more for the energy metrics distribution uh, that they are doing. But we have seen other countries like in Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, they are trying to, to, to study their, their new uh, phases of the nuclear programs. I have seen the studies from uh, feasibility studies from Uganda. Other countries are trying to come up with their own nuclear power plant. They keep constructing nuclear power plants, not just in China, also in Korea, yeah. uh, France as well. Oh, you had don't, don't feel um, discouraged about this. Thank you. I hope I answered your question. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah, so uh, we have just five minutes to go. Uh, I think we have somebody again who 
which is to speak. Yeah, Mr. Masood. Mr. Masood, I guess you have something to say. Uh, thank you, moderator and the panelist. Uh, the first thing I would like to talk about is the language barrier. Uh, plus the fact that, I mean, plus what the panelists have discussed, above all, you need the motivation to achieve your goals. Um, secondly, I think it's also important your kind of personality. You know, your kind of personality in the sense that are you, are you a person that you don't talk to people too much, You're, you hardly talk, you hardly communicate, you hardly interact with people. Because if you're this kind of person, then it's definitely going to hinder your learning curve. You, you will not be able to learn as fast as you should. So one of the things I think you can do, if you find yourself in this category, then you should try to mingle up. Mingle up with people, try to learn their culture, try to enjoy the environment. Because by doing so, you start uh, interacting with people more, you talk more, and the more you actually practice it, the faster you, you, learn, you learn the language, I think. So, I mean, just be determined and also try to see if your personality uh, accommodates learning another culture and language. And secondly, the, I mean, about the discouragement of studying nuclear, uh, nuclear physics, I think every nation will still come back to study nuclear physics. They don't, they don't just have options. Whatever, whatever, whatever they put up as pretext right now, in the future, everything's going to change because we are actually talking more about the danger it possesses. We are not talking more about the advantages that are there. It is not just about the warfare. For example, the nuclear power can change the power, se power sector globally. Globally. And uh, the amount of power you can generate with very little uh, resource, resources with nuclear power can actually give power, electricity now this time around to many countries in the world. So then you start talking about technologies, such as car technologies. The technologies are still coming back to this. The technology of battery storage, for example, also has to do with nuclear. So all these nations that are uh, shying away from nuclear power today because of this uh, danger, in quotes, it possesses, they will definitely still come back to it in the future. So to me, the potential is always there to encourage the, the incomers to always take on the challenge. That is just a little contribution that I have for my own part. Honestly, I salute you for that. And that is the truth. That is the truth. Uh, this was the same fear many of us had so many years uh, back. You know, but the moment we found ourselves in it, we read deeply and we saw the great potentials in nuclear. There is no uh, other source of power today that could stand side by side with nuclear in terms of uh, capacity, in terms of uh, sustainability. And there are a lot of safety measures being put in place. And these are things that are not open to, to the outsider, to the layman on the streets, who is always you know, going with this idea of, oh, nuclear bomb. How many nuclear bombs have we had in history? So uh, some of this fear we must allay them. The truth is what uh, Mr. Masood has said. There is no way the world will run uh, away from nuclear. Of course, one of the major you know, outcries of many countries, apart from uh, the issue of maybe when there, there's an accident. And of course, in history, we've only had just three accidents, you know, compared to the whole lot that occurs in coal and all of that. People die every day in some of these uh, other soils. But uh, you know, uh, apart from, apart from the, the issue of cost is currently being massively researched on. In China, there are a lot of research going on, going on in China, in U.S. and other countries. You know, and uh, that is what is going to bring in the, the advent of uh, 
uh, small modular reactor. That is, uh, is going to drastically reduce the cost of building very big and massive uh, you know, nuclear power plants to something maybe about 60% of that. So, so th there is there is great there is great uh, future with it. For a nuclear power plant, you build it. A nuclear power plant will last for, for 60 years. So you know, just think of that. So we want to encourage everyone that these fears they are not real. All those fears we must allay them. Nuclear is the future. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Masood. Uh, we are gradually, you know, coming to the close of this program, of this uh, webinar section. And uh, for people who might love to follow us, or join us, these are our social media handles. We have, we have WeChat, we have our LinkedIn accounts, Instagram, and of course, Twitter. And we have a link with many uh, international bodies. We have uh, with uh, World Nuclear uh, University and so more than we are still in pursuit of that, so that so that uh, you know there will be there will be there will be an avenue for knowledge sharing. There will be you know opportunities to whoever is uh, willing to to develop his, uh, his his dream, his goal in this uh, in this field. So once again, I sincerely want to salute everyone that has take that has taken their time to be part of this program. Honestly, sitting down for one and a half hours is not just a, is, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's worth being appreciated. We salute everyone that has come. I have a lot of our senior colleagues who are here, people who have graduated. Honestly, we appreciate you. We appreciate you. We can't begin to mention names. I must tell you that we deeply appreciate your, your presence uh, for this program. I would love to call uh mrs jang for the closing remark as we wrap it up Ms. jang is she there hello 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 can you hear me yeah how are you ma great seeing you oh, okay so thank you matthew um hello everyone my name is john jin and i'm also a member of i new peer uh, Priscilla and I have the same mentor, and I'm a candidate for uh, for the doctor's degree in Tsinghua University. Uh, it's my great pleasure to make the uh, closing remarks. Uh, although I don't do the research on nuclear science and technology, uh, my life is deeply influenced by this technology. Um, thanks for the moderator to share the stories of uh, women, si women scientists in history. And thanks for the three uh, female nuclear technology researchers sharing their ideas about the development of nuclear application, their feelings of participation in this field, and their advocation and enthusiasm on motivating more and more people, and especially more women, to enter into the nuclear industry or academic research. Uh, it was fantastic to talk about so many questions uh, about the uh, nu nuclear science and, te and technology and uh, women, women in, in, in this uh, walks of life. Um, and it's wonderful to share the best time with you this afternoon. Um, as far as I'm concerned, although um, there are many biases or restrictions or any other barriers in front of women, uh, especially those who have children. Uh, we all have to pursue our own dreams and all we ha always have a have good uh, vocational plan for our future, uh, whichever, whichever job and whatever uh, we choose to do. Mm. Although there are many potential roles for women in their workplace, uh, with the development of science and technology, more and more people will be released from heavy labor work so that more and more wo women can um, hold the sophisticated work and can be promoted. So we can use our carefulness, patience, as well as intelligence to realize our social value and uh, personal value. And that's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Ms. Jiang. Uh, we appreciate you. And it's good having you. So uh, to everyone, once again, we want to say thank you. Thank you so much. This is our second webinar since we've started, and uh, we still have a lot. And uh, we'll be you know, uh, 
uh, getting back to everyone as we have uh, more uh, interesting and knowledge driven programs. So I want to say thank you for coming. Uh, we'll stay again. So we can exit. The meeting is done. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Florence. Thank you, Kindly follow us on our social media platforms uh, to stay connected with the community. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you very much. Yeah,